They are high-tech armaments. War fought from abroad. It's a technique used by the Obama administration. But there is growing outcry over the morality and legality of drones and what many see as the dangerous precedent the United States is setting in its use of unmanned missiles. Joining us now for more, here's Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst and, of course, executive director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. And welcome back to TVO. Pleasure, As Steve. always, nice to have you here. Well, let's begin with this leaked Justice Department memo from uh, the United States, uh, I guess, outlining who's authorized to kill whom. Who's considered a legitimate target, according to this memo? From the U.S. perspective, and this memo was written it's to deal with a very specific case, Steve, can you kill a U.S. citizen? Uh, so presumably, everybody who's not a U.S. citizen who's a member of al-Qaeda is, is fair game. Uh, that's not a problem. The real issue is, um, does this extend to a U.S. citizen? And that's what the memo is written to deal with. And the answer is... If you're a member of Al-Qaeda and you're imminently planning violence, and by the way, you always are if you're a member of Al-Qaeda, yes, you are. It does not violate your constitutional rights. Is the presumption that you are, if you are doing all of these things, that you're in the mountains of Waziristan somewhere as opposed to in Times Square? No. It actually is very, very specific about that, that the uh, congressional authorization to use military force against al-Qaeda was not geographically limited. Now, it's actually hard to imagine that uh, the president would order a drone attack against somebody in Times Square. Mm -hmm. But on the bigger issue of can you kill a U.S. citizen, this is really a remarkable memo. It says if there's evidence that you are imminently planning an attack, and it doesn't have to be what you and I might think of as, you know, evidence of a real intention to do this tomorrow. The evidence is two steps removed by joining this group that constitutes evidence to attack the United States, and then you're a legitimate target wherever you are in the world. As a fellow named Al Aliki found out, right? Yes. You want to yes. remind everybody his story? Yes. He was uh, an American citizen. Uh, who joined al-Qaeda, uh, or is alleged to have joined al-Qaeda, um, was a very effective preacher uh, and was, uh, again, allegedly inspirational uh, in others committing acts of violence or trying to commit acts of violence in the United States. Uh, the Times Square bomber, for example, and uh, he was uh, killed by a drone attack because he, although he was an American citizen, because he was uh, a member of Al-Qaeda, his father sued, um, claiming that this was a violation of his constitutional rights. That is still in process, but this memo was written to deal precisely with those issues. Who has the authority to launch a strike? So the memo is ambiguous about this. It says a duly constituted senior U.S. official. Well, Clearly, the president is a duly constituted senior U.S. official, but the president alone uh, or the secretary of defense or the director of the CIA. The memo is silent about how far up the chain of command uh, it goes, number one, or how far down, frankly, it goes, and whether you need more than one set of eyes to look at this and make this kind of determination. I mean, we, we know that there is a significant part of the establishment in the United States that thinks that this is inappropriate. Yes. That there should be a lot more checks and balances on this kind of that, thing. You know, the general argument that you're getting in, in, in the American legal community, um, there's just outrage uh, about this, frankly. The web is just sizzling with critical articles. The really interesting challenge is what kind, and everybody can agree that there should be a review process, right? Uh, similar to, for example, I mean, and, and here's the analogy. Uh, if you're going to wiretap somebody, uh, you need a warrant from a judge. Uh, and there's fairly good jurisprudence about what the conditions are for wiretapping. We actually have no court ever, not only in the United States, but generically, that has actually made decisions about the use of military equipment to attack. So there's no judge that needs to give the green light for this to happen? There's no judge that currently nope. gives the green light, uh, nor has there ever been um, a judge that makes a decision about whether or not to authorize a military attack in, in any kind of warfare. And the reason for that is, first of all, the judges do not want this. 
and they're speaking out that they do not want to be put in the position. They consider this an executive branch decision, and the United States, they have division of powers. But more than that, they tell you uh, they're not qualified to make this decision. And for them, they really see this as something that will take them places where it's inappropriate for judges to go. What's the alternative then? Putting in place something like we have in Canada, for instance, uh, CERC, um, the Security Intelligence Review Committee in Canada, which reviews the CSIS. Um, it's, it's open who the members are in our country, but they review after the fact. They don't review before the operation is undertaken. So that gives them some cover. So that gives them some cover. So actually, we have no precedent uh, of a review process, non-judicial, uh, that reviews before the strike is authorized. And that's what's bedeviling everybody hmm. now. Do you know whether, so OK, the judicial class doesn't want the responsibility want of having to green light this. executions. No. Does the political class want the cover of the judiciary before it makes these decisions? Yes, there are. You know, there are members of the Senate Committee on Intelligence, the House Committee on Intelligence, who said this. There should be judicial review. Uh, and senators have spoken out about this. John McCain has spoken out of, uh, about this. Um, and there, and it, that's what provoked. Uh, judges both to write and to say, thank you very much, but we really do not want to do this. We believe this is inappropriate. Where should this ultimately go, Steve? Obviously, it's uh, both inappropriate, dangerous, because you can make a mistake, um, and I think fundamentally antithetical to the U.S. Constitution, dem democratic practice to have a single person, based on the best advice that that president is getting, to decide whether you, Steve, are a member of Al-Qaeda and whether it's appropriate to use a drone. I mean, it's got a bit of a, the mob mentality to yeah, it, doesn't it? We're well, going to put a hit out on a guy. Yeah, that's fundamentally what this is. So what is going to have to happen here is we're going to have to establish some procedure, whether it's the president, the secretary of defense, uh, the attorney general. In other words, they've got to put together some committee where there are you know, a reasonable set of eyes that can act in a timely fashion. Because mm -hmm. here's the trouble. You know, the car is going down the road. Uh, it's only going down the road for the next 15 minutes. It's an up or down decision, and you need to make it. Now, again, think that one through. You could get a decision reviewed that said, should this person be driving down the road in a car and civilian casualties not be an issue? Can we get prior authorization to do this? But can you imagine a set of circumstances where you could have actionable intelligence in a 15-minute window and get a decision in time? No. I mean, it seems pretty no. quick. No. And that's exactly the dilemma that we face in this. And that's why this is unique. Uh, it's not like a wiretap. Because you're going to put a wiretap in place. It, it, tomorrow is, tonight's great, but tomorrow's okay too, and the day after is all right. Mm. That's not the case here, and that's what makes this so difficult. Has there been a movement by any institution of significance, I'm thinking uh, the United Nations, the Department of Justice, whatever, to look into developing some organizing principles upon which you can use these instruments? Yes. So, you know, where drone attacks are, are and the use of drones. Uh, for target assassinations is now so prevalent, number one, by the United States. Number two, others are quickly coming into this game. The Chinese are developing the technology. It will not be long before Iran has the technology. So I think it's in everybody's shared interest to have a set of principles here uh, that would limit the use of this kind of technology. Thinking about this, you know, what's the closest that we've come to doing this, Steve? It's actually on a ground level with a platoon, where you have somebody um, from uh, the legal system within the military who says, "Yes, you can author. You can you you can author. We can authorize this attack because it's consistent with the laws of war." So, and you know, the the U.S. Army does that. The Israeli Army does that. Uh, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that we could not put in place some sort of timely review process and establish a set of principles. Let's and take, it's in everybody's interest. Sure. Let's take a step back for a second. Drones, what are they mostly used for? You know, it's, it's actually, and this is where we're really going to, it's really going to get interesting because drones are actually not principally used um, out to, to uh, 
to assassinate people. They're actually used for surveillance and they're extremely effective. They're pilotless. You survey, you get great intelligence and you don't risk having a pilot shot down, captured. Uh, you know, the Gary Powers nightmare for those of people who remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was a big one. And, and that's why this is so attractive. The over-the-horizon challenge is they're going to be used for civilian purposes. We're now getting miniaturized drones. Not won't be long, stay before you and your sons can go and buy four drones and compete to send your drones down the, you know, down the field uh, and see who can do better at it. These are going to be miniaturized civilian technologies which are going to spill over from the military technology, which is common. And that's what happens often. Uh, you, will, you might be able to have, find a little surveillance drone to follow your daughter around when she's dating, right? <laughs> Uh, we, so that's not far, frankly. Yeah, I need some judicial I mean, oversight on my use of that, so that's for sure. There's going to be some principles. So th what's really at stake here, though, is not the use of drones. It's the use of drones to kill people. Hmm. Let me read something here, uh, just an excerpt from a piece John Yu did in the Wall Street Journal. John Yu, the yes. assistant U.S. Attorney General uh, under George W. Bush. And he writes, rather than capture terrorists, which produces the most valuable intelligence on al-Qaeda. Mr. Obama has relied almost exclusively on drone attacks, and he has thereby been able to dodge difficult questions over detention. But those deaths from the sky violate personal liberty far more than the waterboarding of three al-Qaeda leaders ever did. Okay, that comparison between killing people out of the skies with drones to waterboarding slash torturing people in Gitmo, which was what the Bush administration was accused of doing, is there a moral equivalency here? Well, there's, you know, that, you can't dismiss that argument that if you kill somebody, that is the most serious violation of their constitutional rights. You're violating, the, in the deepest sense, their personal rights. In fact, when you look at this memo, which I suspect uh, Harold Coe, uh, who's a, a lawyer who's now returned to Yale Law School, but was in the Obama administration, had a significant voice uh, in thinking through, if not writing. When you look at that memo, uh, that's leaked, he actually makes this argument. Uh, and I'm not defending waterboarding, let me make myself absolutely clear, but those people lived through the waterboarding. The ones who are taken out by the drones do not. But that's what makes them so seductive to the administration because uh, this is a president who came to office who wanted to close Guantanamo Base, considered it a violation of rights. We don't have procedures to try detainees um, and inter you know, in civilian courts in the United States. And why don't we, by the way, because Congress put its foot down and said that they were utterly opposed to bringing back high-level al-Qaeda operatives who participated in 9-11 to be tried in U.S. courts on U.S. territory. They will not countenance it. So this is a series of contradictions. And Congress is speaking with a forked tongue here, frankly. Do you think that if it were not Barack Obama in the Oval Office, but in fact, say, somebody like George W. Bush, oh. for whom, uh, how do I put this delicately, there was sort of less oh, yeah. respect for his intellectual capabilities, this story would be exploding even more? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, there is already a strong critique coming, but I think if it were somebody that, like George Bush who inflamed the center and the left, uh, it would be explosive. And I think it's important, and actually that's why I believe so strongly we do need legal principles and we do need constraints, because you cannot rely on the judgment and the integrity of any one individual when you are killing either your own citizens or somebody else's citizens. You need a review process of some sort. In our last minute and change here, I want to pick up on something you said a few minutes ago. You pointed out other countries are getting into this as well. And I wonder if we are beginning to see uh, the makings of a global arms race in the sky. There's no question. Uh, there's no question, and I think the push for um, legal principles and restraints is now coming because people are already anticipating that China will be using drones, Iran will be using drones, 
uh, Israel is using drones already, uh, and we will in fact have, one can well imagine five years from now because the technology is already available for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. So almost anybody who wants a drone can have one, frankly, uh, that we can see drones flying back and forth um, with no legal constraint and people using them with impunity. That would be a true nightmare. So whoever wants to could just send a drone out, pick off any political leader you wanted Absolutely. to. Absolutely. That is the nightmare scenario, isn't it? It certainly is. If anybody is. can do it. Absolutely. But still, at the end of the day, you'd have to get the outlaw nations to sign on to some kind of treaty saying that we're all going to play by the right rules, right? The, you know the best time to get restraints in place? When the technology is there, people see it coming, but it's not yet fully available. Hmm. So this, I think, is the moment to put this on the international agenda and begin to do the hard work of getting some constraints and some review in place. And we thank you for putting it on our agenda tonight. That's Janice Stein from the Monk School of Global Affairs. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.